Good morning, everybody. It's 8.05 and let's kick off uh, this exciting week about the future observations that are going to transform our view of the CGM over the next decade. Uh, this week we'll be dealing with new observations that span the full electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, this is a forward-looking week and one in which we hope both observers and theorists will work together to identify how upcoming observables will translate into much needed physical constraints. Um, and so I personally think that this is going to be the best week yet of the workshop. Uh, and we've had some pretty amazing weeks so far. So the bar is already very high. Um, okay, so uh, just a few announcements before we get going. Uh, please join Halo 21 Week 8 Future OBS. That's the channel on the Slack uh, where we will put most of the discussion information this week and substantive comments. Um, Today's beautiful graphic that you see here is uh, from greatobservatories.org. I really love this design, and this is uh, highlighting Habex, Louvoir, links, and origins, um, maybe some of which we'll hear about uh, today. Okay, so a couple announcements, like I said. Uh, in the spirit of a workshop photo, we're going to, on Tuesday, arrange for uh, everybody to come with their, you know, best collared shirts and, you know, combed hair. And we'll uh, take a screenshot of everybody's Zoom video in gallery mode. Um, and I'll try to put it together into a lovely workshop photo that highlights everybody who's uh, participating, at least on Tuesday. Um, and what you can see here is uh, Friday, last week Friday, if you weren't here, we had a uh, hat day, uh, which Ben <laughs> organized, a casual Friday hat day. And uh, this picture was posted in Halo 21 Beauty. Uh, so anyway, right after um, Chris Martin's keynote talk on Tuesday, right after the break, uh, we'll come back and we'll do uh, a full group workshop photo uh, on Zoom. It'll be really fun. Okay, so a couple other things. Today, uh, on Mondays, we've got news to speed collaboration, but today we're going to do something different. Um, we're going to do a structured discussion that highlights 10 observational domains. Uh, and so I'll, I'll give you all the details on that in just a minute. Uh, there are a couple other channels I want to highlight. Uh, one is Halo21-Legacy. Um, this is a channel where we're talking about how to extend the impact of the KITP Halo 21 program beyond this week. Um, and so if you'd like to be part of the conversation, please join that channel um, so you can contribute. Also, uh, I don't have an, annou an official announcement yet, but um, we're thinking about doing some kind of informal uh, night on a kind of gather town or room-like platform where we get together and, and drink to celebrate the end of the conference. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll announce details later in the week, but head over to Halo 21 Socializing uh, if you're interested in, uh, in that. And then also, um, I wanted to mention that uh, Cameron posted a note in Halo 21 announcements that he's going to um, put all of the keynotes and tutorials on the YouTube channel that we've been using for new results uh, to highlight uh, people on the market uh, and soon to highlight some new instruments. We're just going to try to collect all of the videos in, in one place where they're going to be accessible um, you know, for, for a long time. This is part of our legacy. Um, we just didn't, uh, they've already been recorded. They're already on the web, but if for whatever reason you're uncomfortable with this, um, please just, uh, just let us know. I just wanted to highlight uh, a couple new results, our new results channel. Uh, one of the highlights of this workshop has been the new results videos featured on Slack and on YouTube. These are 51 now. We have 51 high quality new results video, all of them four to five minutes in length. And it's really impressive what people have put together. It's an incredible way to consume the kind of uh, new results that have come out in the last year. Our YouTube channel has 87 subscribers and our top viewed video by Renita Jana and Manami Roy, how much cosmic rays can be packed in the Milky Way CGM has gone viral. It has 307 views, wow. Uh, and I just wanna highlight uh, Nikki Nielsen uploaded a new video this weekend uh, on uh, on spatially resolved CGM emission uh, around a nearby star 
uh, Starburst and Galaxy with uh, Duvet. This is a new survey. There's also another video that I just saw that was uploaded um, either late last night or this morning. I'll highlight that later this week. Um, but lots of cool results coming out from the Duvet team. So go check it out, new results. Okay, so this week, uh, Tuesday, we have a, an excellent keynote to look forward to by uh, Professor Christopher Martin. Uh, that'll be in the first hour of our uh, Tuesday, followed by a panel discussion uh, featuring Joe Burchett, uh, Crystal Martin, Chuck Seidel, and Sarah Tuttle. And I just said Joe Burchett, but I meant Joe Burchett. Gosh, sorry, Joe. Um, on Wednesday, we have three excellent tutorials lined up for you. Uh, Edmund will kick us off uh, telling us about X-ray imaging and spectroscopy mission, the new Hitomi, which focuses on soft X-rays. Um, turns out all of the results and data from the three illustrious TNG simulation volumes are publicly available, and Dylan Nelson himself will walk us through some online tools for exploration and analysis of that data that anybody can use. Uh, and then finally, Dr. Nicholas Tejos uh, at Pontificia Universidad Católica del Valparaíso and a frequent observer with Muse will walk us through some IFU data, which is one of the most exciting future observations that can transform our understanding of gaseous halos. Thursday, we will cap off our keynote uh, speakers with two incredible uh, talks, uh, first by Dr. Aurora Simonescu and next by Dr. Nick Battaglia. Uh, the organizers could not decide between new X-ray missions and the upcoming SZ effect focused observatories, which would be more transformative. So both are giving keynote presentations, uh, followed by uh, an exciting panel discussion featuring uh, Dr. Alexei uh, Viklinin, and Dr. Rachel Somerville, Dr. Edmund hodges Gluck, and Dr. Colin Hill. All right, and uh, today, coming up today, right after our featured conversations, uh, we will have an observational domains structured discussion. So what's gonna happen is after the uh, featured conversations, which I'll introduce in just a minute, uh, present in our second hour today, we'll take a slight break and then we'll go into our second hour where I will create 10 breakout rooms. Each has one to two leaders who volunteered on the channel Halo21-OBS domains. And we have 10 rooms, absorption line studies in the UV optical, emission studies, UV optical, X-ray, both emission and absorption, fast radio bursts, SC effect, radio, polarization, gravitational lensing, infrared, and gamma rays. Wow, lots of observational domains here. We're hoping to have one to two leaders per room with people just kind of self selecting which room they go into. So you'll have a choice. You can just go into any of these breakout rooms, uh, especially if you're a theorist and you don't particularly have an expertise, you wanna learn about gamma rays, go into the gamma ray room. Um, and the goal of this discussion will be to identify and clarify the measurable quantities uh, relevant to the CGM that we will be able to constrain in each of these domains over the next decade. We'll come back after 20 or 30, 20 to 30 minutes in the rooms, uh, depending on how the timing goes, and uh, we'll share out uh, what we think are the most exciting things that we discussed in these breakout rooms. So stay tuned for that. But first up, uh, I'm very excited to introduce this week's featured conversations. Um, and so we'll have uh, Halo 21 emission, which has been initiated by Claudia. Uh, oh my gosh, Claudia, I'm so sorry, I misspelled your name. Claudia Ciccone, and that's one C because it's a hard Ciccone. All right, uh, and Dennis Zaritsky uh, will have Halo 21 new instruments, uh, Gwen Rudy and Carlos Vargas, who I don't know if he's here right now. I'm also kind of co-initiating, I'll help out a little bit. Um, and uh, and then finally, we'll get ben, Mark Voigt and Ben Oppenheimer. Sorry guys for not including your pictures here. I figure everybody knows what you look like by now. Uh, discussing Halo 21 parametric model. And so that's it, I'm gonna hand it over to Claudia uh, and, uh, and she will tell us what Halo 21 emission has been up to. And I know that Claudia mentioned uh, there might be uh, an after party at some point this week. So uh, if you're interested in this and this grabs your attention, head over to Halo 21 Emission and join the conversation. Okay, 
So um, thank you, Jess. Yeah. So I was asked by Jess to co-host with Dennis this uh, Hilo 21 uh, emission channel. And uh, since I'm uh, in charge of this uh, uh, initial uh, presentation of the channel, and I'm a some millimeter, millimeter astronomer mainly, um, unfortunately, this presentation will focus a little bit more on the some millimeter radio tracers. But in the channel, we are discussing also other tracers, especially Lyman Alpha is a very popular one in the in the channel. So I decided to uh, show you in the background on the first slide this beautiful image of the uh, northern part of the Orion molecular cloud. Uh, this is a, a map of ammonium taken with the uh, GBT telescope. And uh, this is because, uh, uh, surprisingly, the technical challenges that uh, we uh, astronomers that want to uh, study the CGM in emission using uh, some millimeter radio facilities we are experiencing basically the same technical challenges that uh, our colleagues that want to study star formation in our galaxy are experiencing. Because we want to track, we want to probe large scale diffuse emission. And this is incredibly difficult. Mm -hmm. However, what I want you uh, to, uh, the message I want to give you is that uh, uh, emission line observations of the CGM, especially in the some millimeter. Um, uh, regime, they're challenging, but they're very rewarding. So do not underestimate their power. And uh, I know that traditionally it is believed that the CGM is uh, challenging to observe in emission because it's a diffuse, rarefied medium, and it's hard to detect the emission. However, maybe uh, we don't know that much about the CGM. So maybe it's not so uh, rarefied and diffuse. And uh, I'm arguing we need to be open to surprises. So my question is, are we ready to surprises? And uh, I had the chance to uh, test a little bit the audience here with this survey that uh, I did a few, a couple of weeks ago in the channel, where I, I the, the survey was focused mainly on, uh, on, uh, on the molecular uh, CGM. And there was a question, I, I want to go through all the questions of the survey, but you can find the results in the channel. So this question was, uh, uh, is there molecular gas at uh, um, distances above 20 kiloparsec in galaxies? It's a very generic question, okay? But I was surprised to see that only eight out of 20 uh, people, so 40% believe that there is molecular gas um, at distances beyond 20 kiloparsec in galaxies. And if we include the maybe, we go up to 85%. And this is quite surprising for me. And I will show you why. So we do observe molecular gas above on scales of uh, you know, tens of kiloparsecs in galaxies. Um, we don't have many observations, but we do have some really exceptional results. So this is uh, one of my favorite ones. This is a uh, um, quasar redshift 6.4 uh, that was observed in C plus uh, by us uh, now six years ago. And we detected, uh, uh, so C plus, the C plus emission line at uh, 158 micron is tracing a combination of gas phases. It's tracing molecular gas and atomic gas and a little bit of ionized gas. We don't know the proportion of uh, the contribution of the different phases but we know that it's cold gas, okay, mainly. And in this quasar, Rashi 6.4, this is an isolated quasar, no companions, C plus extends at least up to 30 kiloparsecs from the center. And you see these beautiful uh, uh, structures, uh, most of them are due to a very, very powerful outflow, which uh, uh, has velocities up to uh, 2,000 kilometers per second, and is still up to now the most extended cold outflow ever detected. Uh, uh, but a large fraction of this extended emission is actually uh, due to gas that is quiescent at low velocity. And uh, there is uh, uh, only 30% of this quiescent gas at low velocities is actually in a compact source. And we can tell this because these are interferometric observations. So if you're interested, there are more details in the paper, but we can tell exactly what is in a compact and what is in extended source. Then another source, this is a star forming galaxy. Sorry, just I think I have you up here. 
Okay, I don't know if people can see the, um, my screen uh, because I have just, yeah. So uh, this is another star forming galaxy uh, in the good south field, very massive, observed with ALMA uh, in CO and um, Ginolfi and collaborators detected a 40 kiloparsec size CO structure, okay, around this galaxy. Redshift 3.5. No sign of rotation this time, no sign of, no sign of outflow. This CO reservoir is actually quiescent, low velocity, low dispersion, and there is also associated far infrared continuum. It is not associated with the galaxies. This galaxy has uh, two companions, but the source is actually diffuse gas. At least 60% of it is not in the galaxies. The mass is huge, it's between 2 and 6, 10 to the 11 solar masses of molecular gas. And it is in the uh, diffuse CGM, uh, IGM medium, and this is believed to be a protocluster. I'll go a little bit fast on these results, but uh, just, you know, to show you, maybe some of them you know already, but uh, I haven't seen them mentioned uh, so far in the, in the workshop. This is the spiderweb galaxy. A famous protocluster Redshift 2.2. By the way, it's embedded in the very uh, extended Lyman Alpha Nebula. This was a beautiful result by Bjorn and Mons and collaborators. 90 hours on source with the uh, ATCA telescope. This is an interferometric observation. Detected uh, this uh, huge 70 kiloparsec size molecular gas uh, emission. Okay. At least 30% of it is not associated with galaxies. Again, it's actually in between the galaxies, low velocity dispersion, and uh, the mass is uh, uh, about 10 to the 11 solar masses. And it has been estimated that this molecular gas mass can sustain star formation in the spider web up to redshift 1.6. Then, these are all high redshift observations. So you may ask, but why we don't observe anything locally at low redshift? Because it is more challenging, because we uh, are limited in, uh, in, uh, in terms of spatial scales that we can probe. However, we do have indication at low redshift that molecular gas extends in very extended scales. And for example, we have indication, very, very uh, strong constraints on the uh, class of uh, ULIPs, so local galaxy mergers that are very luminous in the infrared, uh, they show uh, very massive extreme molecular outflows. Okay, now we have uh, samples of tens, several tens of sources. And uh, these outflows, uh, we can track them up to a few kiloparsec for a uh, uh, technical reason. We can, it's very hard to track them further away. But this is uh, one of those examples. This is uh, NGC 6240, a merger dual AGN. It has a beautiful uh, H-alpha nebula. This is uh, the image with Subaru. And uh, in the central uh, 20 second region, uh, this is a map of the uh, CO uh, outflow, okay? And uh, here I just uh, want to show you how beautiful is this, this data. This is a region of the galaxy that is away from the nucleus. So the nucleus has, has been the, the part that has been studied mostly by most of the previous works, right? And if you, if you go a little bit away from the nucleus and you focus in a region that is dominated by the outflow and you extract a, a spectra from this region, you can see this beautiful broad emission in CO, but also in carbon line. And the fact that we detected this emission in CO and in carbon, uh, it allows us to uh, have a decent uh, estimate of the alpha CO conversion factor. And in this galaxy, we actually found that the mass of molecular gas in outflow is uh, um, about uh, uh, at least 60% of the total molecular gas mass that we detect in the merger. So even if we don't track the outflow, uh, further away, there are, there are a few kiloparsec from the source, uh, the outflow is, is really massive, okay? And I want to uh, stress that this is a, a technical limitation. It's, you know, the outflow extends as far as we can probe with the data. And this is another example, NGC uh, 253 at redshift zero. This is an even closer galaxy, a normal, this is a normal Starbucks galaxy. 
uh, that has been studied uh, for many years because it also has uh, multi-phase outflow. Um, what I want to say again in this case, I don't have time to go through the detail, but again, uh, even in this case uh, with very expensive uh, ALMA uh, observations combining ALMA, the ACA, the total power antennas, uh, CO is observed up to the edge of the field of view of the region probed by the data, okay? So what I want to uh, say in this last uh, couple of minutes that I have is that interferometry is evil, okay? We don't, we need to remember that uh, uh, if we use an interferometer, we detect emission only as far as we uh, plan to detect, okay? This is because every interferometric observation is associated with a limited um, spatial extent of the emission that is able to probe. And this is uh, uh, quantified by the so-called maximum recoverable scale that uh, depends on the observed wavelength and the, the minimum distance between the antennas, which is a little bit larger than the diameter of the antenna, okay? So, for example, ALMA is a very powerful machine, but still it's an interferometer, okay? With, uh, um, which means that uh, for every observation at every frequency, you are limited in terms of the maximum scale that you can probe. And if you look at these numbers, uh, in band three is still okay, but basically it's very hard to probe anything that is more extended at 20 arc second, okay? Pretty much at any frequency. If you go to very high frequency, it's, uh, it's really tragic, okay? You can't probe anything more extended than a few arc second. So the question is why, uh, the answer to the question, why don't we see much molecular gas beyond the 20 arc second is just because we can't. Okay, we can't detect the structures that are uh, more extended than this. And this is an intrinsic limitation of millimeter interferometers. And this uh, gives me the uh, opportunity to um, show you this little experiment that we did. It's included in this uh, paper that we wrote for the Astro 2020 Decadal Survey where we were advocating for Atlas for a new 50 meter single dish. Uh, here we took as an input a uh, uh, simulated uh, uh, star-forming galaxy, redshift zero. This is the CO emission from this galaxy. This is a massive star-forming galaxy with a massive molecular gas reservoir. Uh, and in this galaxy, the molecular gas is extended up to 80 kiloparsec. And we ask, uh, how long, how, uh, what do we get after 10 hours of observations with different uh, telescopes? So 10 hours with ALMA give us this, okay? With ALMA, after 10 hours, actually to probe this region, you need 576 pointings, okay? So you need a very, very large mosaic, meaning that for every pointing, you have a very short exposure. And on top of that, you have the limitation that I said, uh, that I was talking before, uh, the, the limited uh, spatial uh, maximum scale that you're able to probe. So with ALMA, you may see a little bit of details, but you miss completely the flux. With ACA, even worse, you don't detect anything. Uh, only with, the, and this was an experiment that we made with a 50 meter single dish antenna equipped with a single ALMA detector. And you can see that a single dish detects, uh, recovers the entire emission, okay? No way to recover this emission with an interferometer. And this actually uh, is the last slide that I wanted to show you. Today is the, uh, the first day actually of our three years long EU funded design study for the Atacama Large Aperture Submillimeter Telescope, which is a concept for a new 50 meter uh, single dish telescope operating in the submillimeter. So if you want to know more about this, uh, please ask me and uh, maybe we can also talk about it in the dedicated channel. And I'll leave you with the, uh, some questions and themes which are actually uh, overlapping with the themes uh, that we have, um, you know, talked about so far during the workshop. And this is uh, what we plan to focus the discussion in the channel. So that's it. Thank you so much for that, Claudia. That was... Uh... That was an exciting presentation for me. I learned a lot. And I think actually, um, so next up, and I'm going to ask uh, Gwen to share her screen. Um, I, I think.
Gwen might even have a slide on at last. So that's that like segues perfectly into the Halo 21 new instruments uh, featured conversation. And uh, and so Gwen is going to share her screen. Uh, and uh, Gwen, when I, if you want me to like chime in on any of the slides, let me know. Uh, otherwise, I'll let you uh, lead this. Sure. Can you guys hear me? Perfect. All right. So thank you, guys. Um, yes, so that's a far, hard act to follow. So we have something um, this week that we're focusing on a variety of new instruments that um, and as well as instrument concepts that might be coming up over sort of the next decade or perhaps even longer that we think could really change the game in terms of understanding the certain black medium. Um, so being largely an observer myself, I picture this as sort of the new toys that we might get to play with um, in, in sort of the coming decade. Um, and I wanted to, to quickly note that Carlos Vargas is going to join us for this, um, but starting midweek, um, there's a whole bunch of different review panels going on of various kinds um, for NAF submissions. And Carlos, along with many of our um, uh, new instrument builders, are sort of focused on that for the first part of the week. All right. So jumping right in. Let's see if I can get these bands. Okay, so a teaser, just a handful of the instruments that uh, we'll be talking about this week, but there are many more, and I'm hoping to get volunteers from other instruments and instrument concept, concepts uh, to join in the discussion. All right, so Carlos will join us. As I mentioned, he is the PI of a newly funded um, small space telescope, part of the NASA front, uh, excuse me, NASA Astrophysics Pioneers um, category that is designed to map the warm, hot gas content of nearby galaxies. This is a mission called ASPERA. Um, so very exciting. This uh, is, as, as I understand it, is funded. So it's we'll have um, in the coming years. So I would definitely invite you to come uh, hear a little bit more about it later this week. Um, this is a project that's very dear to my heart. This is MIRMOS. It's um, the Magellan Infrared Multi-Object Spectrograph. Uh, this is a con an instrument concept for Magellan um, that is led by Nick Conideris. I'm one of the project scientists for this. Um, so this is a large multi-object near-infrared spectrograph that gets simultaneous YJ, H, and K spectroscopy all in one single shot. Um, it has a front end that's either a MOS that can be configured to observe 100 different sources at a time, or very interesting for CGM science, a very large, um, at least for the infrared, 26 by 20 arc second integral field unit that will allow us to do morphokinematic mapping of the redshift one circumlactic medium using optical emission lines um, for basically the first time in the distant universe. So I think this is super exciting for, for new CGM studies that could happen in the uh, um, uh, maybe Jess should, should, uh, talk about this one since she's the project scientist. Yeah. So, um, uh, Sarah Tuttle is the PI of this, uh, concept that we've just proposed to the NASA APRA call. Um, and it's called Moratus and, uh, it's, it's a, a dually pronged, uh, survey. The idea is to do, uh, 06 and emission, right? But to have a very, very wide field, uh, to do cross correlations with galaxies, to do ionizing, uh, escape fractions and to then target a subset of galaxies that have 06 measured in emission in their halos, uh, to supplement that with 06 emission mapping around a, a, a sample. So, you know, we're in the, in the early days of this, but the concept is uh, Sarah Tuttle's. It would fly on a, a 6U cube set, and, uh, and I'm super excited about it. The team right now is uh, Sarah Tuttle, me, uh, Matt McQuinn, Tom Quinn, and Lauren Corleys, and uh, we're, we're lean and mean, and we're looking for money. All right. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Jess. Um, okay, so we just heard um, from Claudia about this uh, this concept, the Atacama Large Aperture Submillimeter Telescope, which can detect and map the circumlactic medium in molecular emission. Um, and there's a lot of other uh, amazing things that are uh, coming online soon. So Yamas uh, is a is a um, blue sensitive but wide wavelength optical integral field unit that's going to be coming on Magellan. Um, Rob Simco, who's the PI, will be here on Wednesday to tell us about it in the after party that I'm about to mention. Um, but there's a lot of other uh, amazing instruments um, coming that um, I'm hoping to have people join us on Wednesday to discuss, including uh, the blue half of news, um, the Roman Space Telescope, which could be very useful for CGM science, ESO HIRAS, which Jess has added very helpfully, not to be confused with tech HIRAS, um, uh, 
uh, the Cosmic Web Explorer. Perhaps someone can join us to tell us about Loire. Um, there's so many new ideas coming online um, that should be very, very exciting for CGM science. So the plan for the week, since this is one of the future conversations, um, on Wednesday from roughly 10 a.m. to sometime when it ends before noon um, Pacific time, we're going to have an instrument roundtable. And so the idea here is that everyone is invited to come learn about new instruments that are being proposed or have already been funded. Um, and we're hoping to have um, instrument scientists, uh, PIs, uh, et cetera, um, or just people who are heavily involved with, with uh, one of these projects come and tell us about it um, to the degree that they are interested, sort of quick five to 10 minute informal discussions of, of these various instruments. If you are involved in one of these instruments and wants to, want to tell us about it, please, please, please make sure that me, Jess, or Carlos know about it. Uh, you send us emails or you can ping us on Slack. Um, and we'll, we'll put this together for Wednesday. I will post um, a Zoom link and so forth in the um, new instrument channel. So um, please come join us and hear about these new instrument concepts. Um, in addition to that, we'll have a few different uh, asynchronous activities. So um, Jess, maybe you wanna tell us about the YouTube videos? Yeah, so one of the ideas that we're hoping to get off the ground is, uh, and, and it looks like actually, uh, I just saw uh, Randall Smith uh, made a video on Arcus, actually, a soft x-ray grading explorer. Um, but these are, I, I, you know, the new instrument builders that we have on the channel are really strongly encouraged to create short videos, um, uh, like five-ish to ten to ten minutes on their instrument with the kind of you know design uh, capabilities and uh, and 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 the um, goals, the objective of the particular mission, uh, the kind of uh, focused science of the mission. So uh, we would love to have those on a specific. Um, playlist for our KITP YouTube channel just to record this for poster uh, you know posterity and to have people you know be able to uh, really understand what these new instruments are asynchronously especially if you can't join this week or um, be part of the instrument roundtable so that's kind of the vision for it uh, this these are all user you know submitted videos so we'll we'll take whatever we can get uh, I know it's a, a large ask um, of you to create a five to ten minute video it's a lot of work, but we hope we can collect them uh, from you this week. So, uh, yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and in addition to this, we're also obviously going to have a Slack discussion. Um, and so here are some uh, ideas that we have for, for proposed topics. Although, as always, uh, new ideas and new uh, discussion topics are absolutely welcome. Um, so the first question that we pose is what Capability is missing and needed for understanding of the CGM. Um, I also thought it would be uh, useful to have another conversation that's a little bit um, higher level, which is how do we organize as a community to find funding or support for new instruments or missions that we feel our field particularly needs? Um, you know, the funding climate for instrumentation is not trivial right now. And so um, I think that this could be a useful discussion to have with so many people participating um, in this KITB workshop. And then, Jess, you want to introduce the last one? Sure. And this actually is a nice segue into the next featured conversation, too, where we've got Mark and Ben introducing this idea of uh, a Santa Barbara CGM parametric model, uh, where they've tried to define all of the relevant physical parameters that kind of govern uh, the physics of the circumgalactic medium. And so in the interest of the new instruments a group getting involved with a parametric model group of the parameters that they'll talk about which of those parameters have the best chance at, which of those parameters do we have the best chances of actually pinning down uh, in the next decade. And I'm really curious to hear what, uh, what people think about that. Perfect. All right, so just a reminder, again, join us at uh, 10 a.m. right after the tutorials um, on Wednesday to hear more from uh, all these amazing um, instrument builders and instrument scientists about the new frontier for observations of the CGM. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you, Gwen. All right, and so that was a nice uh, segue into parametric model. And I think, uh, Mark Voigt, I think you had some slides prepared, right? I, I all right, so um, here we go. Okay, so uh, yeah, the channel, we've had the channel Halo 21 parametric model open for a little over a week. 
And our objective is, is something, and here in quotes, a Santa Barbara CGM model. Uh, and there's actually a manifesto up there on the site. You can read it because every movement should have a manifesto. Um, and we're not trying to take over the world. What we're trying to do is get broad-based community input on a, a, a pretty vanilla generic parametric model describing the CGM so we can um, use multiple kinds of observations and multiple kinds of models uh, uh, to leverage a, a better joint understanding of what's going on with CGM. So uh, here's uh, some of the inspiration for that. Up on the upper left is a figure that Joel Bregman showed in the SZ CGM discussion a few weeks ago. And what it shows is a joint um, resolved YSZ profile for local galaxies where they're, they're huge on the sky. And so you can use Plant to uh, get a resolved pressure profile essentially for uh, 11 local galaxies. Um, below it, is uh, a collection of constraints on the Milky Way's hot atmosphere from X-ray absorption and emission and RAM pressure stripping and uh, also a dispersion measure to the LMC. Uh, and so there's a bunch of uh, constraints there that are in the neighborhood of one another. Uh, and uh, if we want to kind of get, get, get their combined power to constrain the Milky Way CGM, uh, we need a parametric model to do that. On the upper right is a collection of constraints on the pressure profile uh, around uh, galaxies that have been observed with COS. So the UV absorption lines give you an opportunity to estimate pressures using photonization modeling. And uh, one of the things you can see in the top panel of that, if you, <laughs> if you have really great eyes and you can make out all the fine print, is uh, the pressures at any given radius are dependent on halo mass not really surprising that you would have higher pressures in, in halos that are more massive. And when you try to take out that halo mass dependence, uh, those points converge onto a more universal pressure profile. Uh, what was interesting is taking that universal pressure profile and trying to overlay it on Joel Bregman's results uh, from, from his group. And it looks like there's pretty good agreement, at least, you know, as far as the agreement you can get by drawing lines with Keynote on other people's plots. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we want to do a little better than that. Um, also, uh, if you look in the lower right, that's a plot made by taking the Milky Way constraints and trying to overlay them on the pressure profile constraints. Uh, so, so there seems to be some convergence possible by taking a lot of different observations from different wavelengths and combining them to get joint constraining power. Um, you can also, we also would like to compare analytic models with simulations. We've heard a lot about, you know, which, what's the best analytic description of what we're seeing in simulations. This is just a, a bunch of lines in a plot showing uh, some analytic models and some simulations that show, uh, you know, they, they're close to describing similar things, but uh, what's the basis for intercomparing them? So uh, this, okay, and I need to make a disclaimer. Um, this is completely a drawing. There's no science whatsoever, no data whatsoever, no models whatsoever in the diagram. It's just a bunch of wishful thinking, okay? But the point is to show that uh, a lot of these observables constrain the CGM in different ways. So if we can um, have a, a description that applies to all of them that's parametric, then we can get better leverage on the description of the CGM than we can get from any single approach. And so uh, this is like a, a parallel <laughs> to the conversations we're having this week about observational approaches uh, is how do we now combine them? And if we have a, a joint community description that's you know kind of theory neutral, it will also help show how the different missions we want to propose are complementary. Uh, now, I, I, I've kind of framed this discussion in terms of uh, a pressure model, but we've also heard a lot about how the CGM is multi-phase. Uh, and if we're gonna understand how the phases relate to each other. Mark, using... can I interrupt you for one second? Your, um, 
color palette is showing and it's blocking some of your slides. Oh, weird. And it's not, it's not shown on my own slides. <laughs> so maybe it's if I- It's not horrible. I just noticed it was blocking some of that figure. Let me so. see you think. Right. How about now? Oh, yeah. perfect. Good job. Okay. All right. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so you've seen that my favorite color palette is Spartan green, probably. Let's go green. Um, okay. So, uh, so uh, we've heard that maybe uh, at the high temperature end, maybe things are log normal. At the low temperature end, they are uh, determined by photonization. And there's this intermediate temperature stuff that we love to get better handle on. Okay. Uh, how can we combine different kinds of constraints to understand it? Uh, also, we've heard a lot about non-thermal pressure support, and I, I've, I've cribbed a figure from Ben Oppenheimer, a really uh, influential my thinking paper, about uh, how all the different kinds of non-thermal pressure support show up in simulations and how they depend on radius. Um, this kind of thing has been uh, ha has some heritage also in galaxy cluster uh, observations and modeling, and here's a paper from Earl Lau and collaborators. So we want to also be able to describe that. And, and here's the key. We want to be able to do it in a way that's generic enough that uh, a broad swath of the community <laughs> would like to participate, not, not favoring any particular point of view, but one that is, is fairly generic so we can you know, jointly cooperate. So the conversation has already started, but this week it will be featured. I'm putting together right now an after party that's going to be tomorrow. Uh, 12 p.m. Pacific, and I think it's obvious that uh, the more people who are involved and offering opinions and critiques, uh, the, the more useful this effort is going to be because uh, you know it, it, its usefulness is is directly proportional to or maybe even a, a nonlinear function <laughs> of the number of people who who see that their um, their ideas have been incorporated. Um, so we invite as many people who want to participate into that conversation and, and look forward to a future in which <laughs> we can really uh, combine the strengths of all the things that we're gonna be talking about this week. I will now cede the floor back to Jess. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Mark. So it sounds like we all have a lot to think about. There are 80 of us here. Okay, there are 10 breakout rooms, each associated with one particular observational domain. If you need to see that list again, because my abbreviations aren't awesome, head over to Halo 21 OBS domains and uh, the pinned post there has details on what's going to happen. But remember, in these rooms, we're going to be clarifying the measurable quantities relevant to the CGM that we will be able to constrain in each of the domains over the next decade. Now we're gonna take a break until uh, 9 a.m., so a nine-minute break where you can decide uh, what room you want to participate in. I've had some very brave volunteers um, uh, who said that they can record some of these channels, maybe not all of them, uh, some of these breakout rooms, maybe not all of them, but this is a time to learn about the possibilities, uh, and you're welcome to choose your own breakout room, so think carefully. Um, it would be really nice if we had some semblance of balance uh, between the rooms. I'm not going to mandate that each room have the same number of people, but um, you know, if you go into a room where there's like 12 people and you see that there's a room with one person, you want to be the brave soul who who goes to, you know, that less traveled path uh, and, and, and joins the exciting room where few people have dared to go, um, <laughs> you know, uh, please do so. So, okay, so let's take a break, an eight minute break. When we come back, we will self-organize into our rooms on the 10 observational domains. I'm happy to answer any questions before we do that. And uh, yeah, see you in a minute or eight minutes. <laughs> 